Well, welcome to a very special podcast and video, by the way. In fact, I, I, I think the video will work better for what I'm trying to do, but I'll do my best to keep the podcast listener uh, involved in, uh, in this process of responding to one of the most common questions I get, and that is, how do you teach a teenager to invest? How do you introduce them to the process of putting them away money for the long term? How do you make it real? How do you make it stick? Uh, a lot of the uh, research that my friend Lou Mandel did indicated that young people, when they learn about investing, do not retain it. Uh, and, and, and the reason that they don't retain it is because they don't put it to work. Well, I'm advocating for a way to put it to work. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk with the parent, the grandparent, the aunt, the uncle, the friend who might in fact help a young person do this. I'll talk you through it but I'll also be talking to that young person that you might just let watch this particular uh, video or listen to this podcast uh, to understand what it is I'm trying to accomplish in this introduction, this hands-on introduction to teach a young person the right steps that could could hopefully last for a lifetime. How many times have we said or heard somebody say, I wish I had known about this when I was younger. I wish somebody had taken me by the hand and, and, and introduced me to the right steps. So I'm going to do that today. And, uh, and, I, and I'm serious about this in terms of one in it to work for you. If at the end of this presentation, you don't get it, there are parts that are confusing. I've never made this presentation before, so uh, uh, it, 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 may need, it may need some work. But if you will simply email me, paul at paulmerriman.com, and uh, tell me what your question is, and, and, and give me a phone number. So... If it means that I need to have a short discussion with you, I can give you a call because this is one of those cases where I really want you to get it because I think we can make such a difference in a young person's uh, financial future. So I'm going to, to pull up here a screen I'll be working from and uh, uh, in fact, uh, allow me just for one second to check here. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, I've actually tried to do this several times and it didn't work. So I'm hoping the uh, fifth time is the charm. All right, here we go. How to teach a teenager about investing. Now, I've got about 24 tables. I'm not going to show them all. But there will be a link so that you will have all of these tables to work with, to get to know and sort through the ones that you want to use to make the case to the young person that, that you might be helping. So uh, here we go. Let's talk about how to teach a teenager about investing. I want to start with a few quotes from Warren Buffett. I don't know if teenagers will know who Warren Buffett is, but maybe it suffices it to say that he is one of the richest people in the world, and he's become that way by being a very smart investor. And one of the ways I'll show you today uh, to invest is exactly what Warren Buffett recommends that you do. And then I'll do my best to show you one better, but... Uh, uh, let's hear his words. When he talks about success, and it's not just success with investing, he says you only have to do a very few things right in your life 
so long as you don't do too many things wrong. And I totally agree that is true with investing. There are literally uh, no more than a dozen things you really need to know and not be influenced by the hundreds of things that really wouldn't be in your best interest. And that's one of the focuses that I have in the work that I do. And I'll introduce you, know, you to a book that is meant to do that for young people. And then another point that Warren Buffett makes that is contrary to what so many adults say, because the adults so often will say, the best way to learn how to invest is just get in there and do it and you make mistakes and you learn from your mistakes. But let me tell you from my experience, many people make those mistakes for literally decades before they get it right. Warren Buffett said, it's good to learn from your mistakes. It's better to learn from other people's mistakes. And so in the information I'm going to share with you, uh, I, I certainly have done my best to make sure that I share with you what I've learned uh, to do it right. And I've seen so many mistakes and made them myself. I don't want young people to lose lots of years of good productive uh, earning power uh, while they're making the mistakes they just simply don't have to make. And finally, and I really like this one because I want to do something extraordinary here. And Warren Buffett says, it is not necessary to do extraordinary things to get extraordinary results. And I think you'll see how that is true in just a few minutes. I have a young fellow I'm working with on this very project to get him started with investing. And there's one demand that I've made because I'm about to put up some money. And so is he, by the way, going to have to put up some money but I'm not putting up my money, nor do I want him to put up his money until he gets it, until he understands the basics of smart investing. And I'm not talking about heavy duty research into individual companies and, 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 and having to learn something that would, would take a, a four year college course to learn. I'm talking about something that can be learned in a matter of a few hours. And my requirement to this young fellow that I'm working with is to read, we're talking millions, 12 simple ways to supercharge your retirement. I want that book read before I start moving to the next step uh, with this young fellow that I'm working with. And the reason I want that to happen is because I'm going to be talking about things that he likely doesn't have any background right now. And so I want him to read the book, he'll get the background, and then I'll reinforce it as I go through these simple steps. So uh, I hope you can get whoever you're working with to, uh, to take the time. It's about a, it's about a two, three hour read and uh, they don't have to understand everything they read. But I think that read of the book along with this, uh, what I'm going to share over the next few minutes uh, will be impactful. I'm talking about trying to create a partnership, a winning combination of two investors the one we already have discussed is this young teenager, could be somebody in their in their twenties, but I'm trying to get to him earlier if that is uh, if that's possible. And what I want to have happen is I want this teenager to earn some money. Now, all for the purpose of this discussion, I want them to earn is a hundred dollars. I want them to earn that in a way that it is legal for them to use that as the basis of making an investment in an IRA, an individual retirement account. And I specifically want it to be a Roth 
IRA. Now they'll learn about the Roth in the book, but the beauty of the Roth is that we put money into it that once it is inside of that Roth IRA, it can be left to grow and pay dividends and pay profits because the, the value of stocks go up and maybe some stocks are sold in the process and those profits that are made from the selling, they are not taxed. All of the growth within the Roth IRA compounds tax-free. And then the magic date comes along. I'm using 70, age 70 in this little study you're going to see. But at age 70, you start taking money out. You can take it out earlier, but I'm using this as an example. You start taking the money out. And as you take the money out, not one penny of it is taxable. And so the ability for money to grow without paying taxes for 20, 30, 40, even 50 years, and then to be able to take it out and not have to pay any taxes, that is um, an amazing, it has amazing possibilities. And uh, we're going to see that in just a few minutes. So let me tell you, and I've got a couple of links. One is to Fidelity. And Fidelity has a page where they talk about the custodial Roth IRA. That is for people who have not turned 18 and where a parent or somebody else, an adult, could be the, the custodian to open up that Roth IRA before you're 18. And the beauty of doing this at Fidelity or Schwab is there is no minimum. If you want to do it with $25 a year, if you want to do it with $10 a year, you can. What I want you to do is to get in and do it and see how it works. Experience it for a number of years. But now they make one point that's important, and that is this money that you earn, this $100. It can't just be because you got an allowance. It is an interesting difference that they draw. They, they see potentially an allowance as something a child gets without having to do anything. That's not the way the IRA works. It, it can be funded when there is earned income and not earned income from dividends, but from your labor. So if you mow the lawn, if you babysit, there's a number of things you could do that a parent or a neighbor or a relative could pay you to do that work for them. And it qualifies to be able to use it to put in the money into or other money into the Roth IRA. So if the child, the teenager earns $100, what I want from them is I want them to take $50 of the 100 that they made, and I want it to go into a Roth IRA. And I'll show you how you can invest it. In fact, I'll give you four choices so that you'll see the range of risk and return that you might have access to. I want the $50 to come from the child and then... In preparation for the time when they get their first big job and the company has a 401k plan or a 403b plan and the company matches the money you put in to that investment, not all of it normally, but some of it. And so what I'd like to do is to set up with this young investor a match program. And that match could come from an uncle, from an aunt, from a, could come from a, 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 an adult friend uh, who, who would like to help out. But I want somebody to match your $50, the investor's $50, with $50 from somebody else. So that together, the team has put together $100. And because the child earned $100, you can put the hundred in there. By the way, you don't even have to use the child's money. If that child has, has, has legitimately made that money, you could put the whole hundred in there. But I'm thinking it's better if they have some skin in the game, okay? 
And so you each have 50 and you make the commitment that you're going to do this for 10 years. So in essence, the child is going to put away 50 a year for 10 years or $500. And whoever is working with the child will put in the match for $50 a year for 10 years. That is the combination I would like to see. And so for 10 years, you're accumulating wealth by putting the money in there. And then you stop. And you allow that $1,000 to grow. And of course, I'd like to see you put it into something that has the likelihood of growing a lot. But you may be uncomfortable with that, and, and the child may, and I will give them an opportunity to see the difference between uh, more aggressive and less aggressive investments. But you let that go until they're 69, 70 years old, at which point you start taking money out of the investment. And we'll show you several different ways that you could take the money out to give you a, a sense of what that could mean later in life. And then when you finally pass on, when you die, you leave whatever's left over that you haven't taken out to spend tax-free. You leave to your heirs or to charities tax-free. So that's the process put some away for 10 years, then let it go into hibernation, growing, well-fed, hopefully by the market, and then eventually using that money to help you meet the cost of living. Certainly, a $1,000 investment is not going to take care of you for the rest of your life, but I think that you will find uh, an exceptional outcome if you take the right steps. Now, let me tell you, take you to the point where you're going to make a decision about how are you going to invest that money? And I would love to be talking to that, that 16 year old right now. And by the way, in this study, we're assuming it's a 60 or 16 year old. He could do it with a 12 year old. He could do it with an eight year old. I mean, legitimately you can pay for work done, an eight-year-old, and as long as you keep the tr keep records of it, uh, you, from everything we know, you're not going to be challenged. In fact, it's unlikely with the peanuts we're talking about that you're going to be challenged anyway. But you want to do it right, so you keep track and uh, and what what was done, what kind of work, and how much they were paid. So now the kid, the child has been paid. And what are the choices? Well, the first choice that they could make is the safe choice. It's the choice where there's almost no risk at all. And there is some growth. And the way that that is done is you put your money into a bond or a bond fund, a mutual fund that holds bonds. What are bonds? Bonds are IOUs to either the government or the or, or from the corporation. Corporations could borrow money from, from investors. The government can borrow money from investors represented by these bonds. These bonds pay a small amount of interest for having borrowed the money, just like if, if, if the bank loans you money, you have to pay interest. Well, you can loan the corporation's money through bonds. And the good thing about bonds is almost all of them make good on their guarantee to pay what you loan them plus the interest. The question is, how much interest are you likely to get? And looking back at 93 years worth of data, going back to 1928 here in this particular uh, table, and looking at the returns in all 40-year periods for government bonds. These are three types of government bonds. I'm not going to get into the details, but here's what is important. The average return for bonds over the last 90-plus years is about 
So I am going to use as the assumption that if you put money into bonds, where you get a guaranteed return, that you will get 5%. Now, bonds, just like stocks, go up and down. They pay different levels of interest at different times. And so right now, you wouldn't get 5% in a bond. But historically, that's been the average 40-year return. So let's look at one of the tables, table one. And there are 24 different tables you can look at. I'll show you a few of them, but let me explain this table, particularly to the people who are listening to a podcast. This table reflects the growth of the investment over the first 10 years at $100 a year. Remember, 50 from the child, 50 from the parent, the grandparent, the aunt, the uncle, or maybe it's a group of of relatives who get together to come up with the 50 bucks, whatever it takes. And remember, it can be done with 25 and 25. It could be with $10 and $10. What you want to do is to get the hands-on experience, create the habit. So I see in the table, the results of putting away $100 a year, making 5%. And I see at the end of 10 years, that it has grown to be worth $1,321, okay? But the page goes on. But it goes on showing each year's growth, but no more money invested because what we're looking at now is the result of just the 10 years. And then it grows and it grows year after year after year until you're 69 years. If you started this when, when you were 16, it's been growing for 54 years. Tax-free. And what's it worth? Over $11,000. But now you start taking money out. And we're going to take money out at a rate of 4%. So you'll get four dollars for every hundred dollars that's in there on an annual basis well it turns out because you've got about eleven thousand dollars that the first annual payout is four hundred and fifty two dollars and then we start seeing every year money is being paid out until at age 95 basically you have that's the end of your life you die you pass on whatever, however you want to describe it, you now are leaving whatever's left over that you didn't spend to your heirs. How much did you spend? About $12,000. How much did you leave? Around $14,000. So the end result of your $500 plus the 500 from somebody else in the family or a friend left alone to grow at 5%, grew to be worth a total payouts and what was left at death of about $26,000. Now that is a legitimate step you could take with your money, but I want more. I know, and I want these young people to know that historically stocks as a group not one by one. You don't want to invest in stocks one by one. One by one, they can go broke. But when you own large numbers of companies, then the probabilities of all of them going broke is as close to zero as anything we know in the business. But what do we know about equity stocks? We know they're very volatile. We know they're priced not based on a guaranteed 5% every year, but there it is ownership of the companies. That's in, at the end of the day what you have. And whether it's Microsoft or Alphabet or Tesla or, or some you know 3M or, or IBM, uh, whatever it might be, you are participating in the growth of those companies inside of what's called a mutual fund, which is nothing more 
and combining the money from a whole bunch of people and having it managed for them. Now, on this page I'm showing you now, I'm looking at long-term returns of the stock market, and I want to focus just on one kind of stock at this point, and that's the stock that you'll see it's called USLCB. That represents large cap blend companies. They also call it the Standard & Poor's 500. These are basically the 500 largest public companies. As I said before, you would know the names of many of them. Walt Disney, there's another one. Nike, I mean, many of those companies are part of the daily life of a young investor. What do we know about the last 93 years? The index, that group of 500 stocks, it has grown at 10% a year. Not 10% every year. In fact, the best one-year return, it's on the table here, was a gain of 54%. The worst one-year return was a loss of 43 so you're going to have about 75% of the years have been profitable, about 25% of the years have been unprofitable, and the average losses are much smaller than the average gains. And at the end of that period of time, it was a very profitable thing to do, compounding, growing at 10% a year. And it even turns out that if you looked at all the 40-year periods starting in 1928, and then 29, and then 30, and you follow those 40-year periods, that the average 40-year return for the S&P 500 large cap blend was 11%, not 10. And the very best was 12.5%, and the very worst was not a loss. The very worst 40 years was an almost a 9% compound rate of return. Now, you could put your money all in stocks if you wanted to. And I'll show you that in a few minutes. But there's another step you can take. And it's actually a pretty smart step. I don't think it's going to make you the most money but it's still a very smart step. There is a kind of a mutual fund. Remember, combining investments from a whole bunch of people. There's a kind of mutual fund called a target date fund. And the beauty of a target date fund is it's professionally managed for people who are kind of the same age as you are looking to retire at some point in the future. And so the people who professionally manage this money, when you are young, they want to have most of the money in stocks. I would actually prefer they had all of the money in stocks, but they would have most of the money, let's say 90 to 95%. And then as you get older and you get closer and closer to retirement, they add the bonds. They stabilize the portfolio because in theory, as you get older, you want to take less risk. Not everybody does, by the way. A lot of people are all in stocks for the all of their life. But most people are going to move gently, slowly into bonds as they get older. These target date funds do it all for you. You don't have to do a thing. You just have to put the money to work. And here's what we know. That a target date fund over a lifetime of saving and accumulating should probably grow at about 8% a year. During the earlier years, more. During the latter years, lower. But that it would be about an 8% compound rate of return. Now, we could, we could invest in a target date fund, and instead of getting a 5% growth rate, 
probably get something around an 8% growth rate. And if we did that, instead of having, remember with the 5%, uh, you put the money away for 10 years and then you just let it ride, you let it kept, keep growing. Well, at 8%, instead of, and I'm looking clear out to the point that that you die, that you pass on, and you and you have spent a whole bunch of money, and then you've left money. Remember what you ended up with for five percent was about twenty six thousand dollars. With the eight percent return, not that much different. It was then about, whoop, excuse me, I lost my place here. Uh, it was. Uh, Oh, I got I to go back. Hang on. Uh, it was about $188,000. So about seven times more money than you would have had with the 5% earnings on the bonds. Huge difference. Huge. But what if you didn't own any of the bonds? What if all you did was put your money in the S&P 500, the 500 large, largest corporations? And by the way, I'm not recommending you do this with all of your money, but you could do it with this early money where you're going to have all these extra years to have it compounding and grow. And it is a small part compared to what you're going to have otherwise. So I'm thinking it would be okay just to let it grow and be in the S&P 500. And here it is. Remember, the 40-year average was 11%. Let's not be that optimistic. Let's assume that it's a 10% compound rate of return. What does that look like? Well, it looks a lot different. You remember, at 5%, it grew to about 28000 at 8%, it grew to about 188000 At 10%, between the money that's paid out to you in retirement and the money that's left over for heirs, almost, almost $700,000. And remember, the worst 40 years ever was a loss of about 9%, I mean, sorry, a gain of about 9% a year. So there is potentially, we can never say guaranteed, but there is potentially a huge advantage, premium, for having an all-stock portfolio. And with this small amount of money for all of these years, I say, why not? But remember, I talked about, yes, the big companies, the large companies here. Over here in this group, U.S. small cap value. These are companies that are much smaller than the S&P 500. And these small companies represent an asset class. If you bought them all, and you can, that's the interesting thing. You can basically buy them all as one investment. And that group has historically, uh, if you look at the 40-year compound rate of return, over 16%. In fact, the very worst 40 years was a gain of 11.6% of a year, almost 12 so I'm thinking, let's not get greedy. Let's just assume that it would be reasonable to get 12% instead of 10 for the S&P 500. The academics think that is reasonable, that these smaller companies would do better as a group than the larger companies. And you take more risk. And when you take more risk, what you want to do is have massive diversification. So you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these companies in this one portfolio, but they're all basically dedicated to small cap value companies. I'm, I'm 86. I have half of my equities 
in small companies. And, and, and so it is not unusual to have some of these in your portfolio until you die. Anyway, I got to quit talking about dying, but I got to keep looking at how much you're likely to leave when you get there. And here we go. Here's the 12% pool. We see those same 10 years, those first 10 years. And by the way, there's a really good lesson here. If I look at the first 10 years of uh, the 5%, at the end of 10 years, I've got about $1,300. If I look at the first uh, 10 years of the 12%, I've got almost 2,000. It does not seem like a million dollar difference. It does, it, they feel very similar somehow. And that's the part that's so interesting about the impact of compounding because these higher rates of return grow on themselves and they get bigger and bigger and bigger. But in this case, you quit putting money in after 10 years. What did you have between, at age 95, between the money you took out, almost $800,000, and the money that you left to others, over $1.7 million, you have accumulated over $2.5 million. I mean, that is... That is simply the impact, the magic of compounding over time. And the way that happens is one, to be in an asset class that grows faster and let it go. Don't interfere with the long-term growth and don't panic when it goes down because yes, they go down from time to time. I can tell you in the last year, the, the, the mutual fund, the ETF that we recommend that you use for small cap value is up about 42%. If we look at the S&P 500 in this last year, up about uh, 28%. If we look at the target date fund, up about 15 to 16%. And if we look at the bonds, Actually, bonds didn't have a very good year in 2021. They lost about 2%. So this is nothing of this is going to be in a straight line. There'll be times of amazing growth with equities. There'll be times of bad losses. And everybody might have a different, different idea of what bad is. But from time to time, the stock market goes down half, not very often. I think it has done that uh, three times since 1970, but it does happen. So this is the story. If you put in $50, get somebody to match 50, do it for 10 years. But I want you to see something very interesting. What happens when you don't stop putting that $100 away? How big does that pot of gold get to be? Well, let's look, for example, at the target date fund. 8% compound rate of return. What we would know from that is that over the age 16 to 94, over that period of time, you would have taken total distributions of, oh, just a minute here, this thing jumped on me again. You would have taken distributions uh, of about 135,000 with an end balance to leave to others of almost 200, well, over 209,000. So a total benefit of $344,000. Now that's based on putting away $100 a year for 54 years. $5,400 investment worth $344,000.
but the first 10 years all by itself grew to be worth 188, remember? Which means that the first 10 years accounted for more than half of the money that you ended up with, which means if you waited until you were 26 to get started, you would have much, much, much less money. That's at 8%. What if we look at 10% and continue to put $100 a year away? Well, instead of ending up with about $700,000 based on only investing for 10 years, you end up with a little over 1.1 million. In other words, you made about $400,000 more because you added all those 44 years of $100. In other words, the first 10 years is the most important. It represents way more than half of what you have at the end of this whole period of time. And it even gets bigger when you look at 12%. Because if you put 100 away every year, $100 for 54 years, and then you live off of it for 25 years, you end up with about 3.75 million, which by the way, is about $1.2 million more than you would have had from just the first 10 years. So there is a lesson here about the the great importance of those early years. And it's worth trying to, to find somebody to help you uh, help you build this up. By the way, I don't know if you've already considered this, but if you somehow had the ability to work a little harder, save a little more, and instead of finding 50 plus 50, found 100 plus 100, and you had $200 a year to put away, all these numbers double. Everything doubles. I don't care if it's the 5% answer or the 12% answer, they all double. So literally, if you go, I'm looking now at putting away $200 a year from age 16 through 69, and then living off it from 70 through 90 through age 94, instead of 3.75 million it's going to be over seven and a half million dollars. Okay. And from a hundred dollars more per year, that is the magic of compounding. That is why we want you to start early. Now I've got a couple of pages here. Uh, when you look at all the tables that we produced, some of the tables have to do with how much money you take out. We've been talking about taking out 4%. You could take out more. Yes, you could take out more and enjoy more and leave less to your heirs. And when you do that, you do increase the take-home pay, if you want to call it that, a little bit, but you also reduce the amount of money you leave to your heirs uh, by a significant amount because you've taken some of the money out of circulation to spend. But you're saying, hey, that's what it was for. Okay. So we also show here taking out 5%. Uh, we show, we show uh, taking out 6%. Uh, these are all tables that you could uh, that you could look could look at later. Um, I might just note that when you take out six percent instead of four percent, you end up with a total benefit of money that you spent and money that you left of two point eight million. Now that, uh, if I compare it, let me uh, see if I can go. Well, let's see. I may not be able to go back to that. Ah, yes, yes. And, and, and that is going to be uh, more than a million dollars difference. 
in what you would end up uh, being able to, uh, uh, to, to leave to others. So there's a cost to your spending. There is fun that comes from spending. Recommended funds. Uh, there, there are lots of funds you could use. I've talked about the bond fund. I don't want you to go into a bond fund, so I'm not going to recommend one. It would suggest that I think you should do that. I don't think you should do that. But a target date fund, Fidelity, Freedom, 2065. It's their index 2065 fund. Low low expenses, which means higher returns for you. No load, no commission to buy, no commission to sell, which means more money for you. And remember, the Fidelity Freedom, it's a target date fund. They're going to make all of the moves for you, and the expected rate of return is about 8%. And as I mentioned earlier, this year in, in 2021, uh, it's made, I think, about 15 to 16%. Why did it make less than the S&P 500? Well, for one reason, because it has international stocks in the portfolio, and it wasn't a very good year for internationals. But there'll be years that international stocks do better than U.S. stocks. So there's a reason it has the diversification that it does. Then we have the Fidelity Zero Large Cap Index. That mutual fund not only has no commission to buy or sell, but no management fee. So that uh, as much as possibly can uh, goes to the bottom line. Uh, but it would be a fund like the S&P 500. And finally, I mentioned the small cap value fund that was up over 40%. Uh, that's that's uh, the, the, the Avanta small cap value exchange traded fund. That is a, that's a kind of mutual fund. I'm sure you read about it in We're Talking Millions. So there you have my recommendations, an idea of what the returns might be like, and the lessons learned, they're huge. One, the power of starting early. Two, the power of choosing equities over fixed income, over bonds. Three, the power of small cap being better than S&P 500 and the S&P 500 being better than the target date fund. And every time you get a higher return, it's because you took more risk. But we're not talking about the risk of the next year or even the next five years. The risk over the long term actually turns out to be lower with the more aggressive investments than the more conservative. That's because they grow to be worth so much more money before they have a decline, although you could have the decline right after you get started. By the way, by the way, this is important. I would have forgotten this if I hadn't had that thought. When you are building and you're putting a little bit of money in every year, it's called dollar cost averaging. And if you put it in at a point that the market is down, that is actually good. That means that you're buying more shares with the money you're putting in. And that is, in the end, what you want are more shares. We are having we get the, the lesson about the Roth tax-free growth and tax-free distributions. It is the ultimate tax-advantaged investment. And finally, your success is actually pretty easy to judge. Let me go back for just a second, if I might. Let's go back to just looking at this table, table 24. This is the table that shows the $100 a year every year for 54 years getting 12%.
well, we know where you should be at the end of 10 years. You should be somewhere around $2,000. Might be a little less, might be a little more. And by the time you get out 20 years, you should be around $8,000. Might be less, might be more. But you know, because you have this as a guide, how am I doing? And if at the end of the first year, you have more than $112, you're doing just fine. And if at the end of 39 years, you have $76,000, you're doing fine. If you have 70,000, you're probably okay as well. If you have 85, you're ahead. But you wanna know, are you in the ballpark? Because it is amazing how it starts to add up in the latter years of this whole process. At the beginning, I made the requirement of the young man I'm working with, he's a relative, and 19. And I will not talk with him again until he has read, we're talking millions. You can buy that book at Amazon if you wish, that's fine. The, the, any profits go to the foundation, that's fine. But why don't you get it free, the PDF, and here, right here, at paulmerriman.com slash sign up, you can get a free copy. And during that year that you get this free copy, you'll be able to put that additional money into your account. And by the way, it looks like it could become worth a lot of money over the next, what, 70 years or so. I hope this helps. I hope this helps you tell the story to others. I hope maybe I've told the story in a way that it might be okay for a young person just to listen to what I just went through. Although I should and I will do one where I address the young person only and not the parent. And, uh, and I made the offer. If it's confusing, if there's something you don't understand, and I've given you some, some links in the, uh, um, in, the art, in the podcast and, and in the video information so you can find out more before you call me, make sure that they, those answers aren't right in that information. And, um, and I hope you do this. And I wish I could be around to see how it works out. And that's the bad part about, about this business. The really great story is yet to be told. And I won't be here to see it happen. But I know from everything I've learned in almost 60 years around this industry that, uh, that it will happen with time, discipline, the right saving habit, and patience. You can do it. And good luck. Thank you.